Hello team and welcome to another ATP Geopolitics video with myself Jonathan MSP. This is Ukraine War Frontline update for the 11th of September 2023. Before we go any further please check the map legend on the screen and that will tell you what all the different colours uh, and the lines represent on my map. And before we go to the front line per se, let us look at something I said I was going to talk about, which is Tendar's piece here. Uh, and I, I really agree with this, and I'll, I'll expand on some of the thoughts here. So this is just a general kind of analysis of, I think, how it's going for the Ukrainians now. Ukrainian forces are cracking the Russian defense lines step by step. They drive a chisel into the lines and they wide and then widen the rift by moving into the flanks. This might not look fast, but it is how you break defense networks and it is working. This is, however, not even the most important news. More importantly are the Russian troop movements in this sector, in that sector. The deployment of the Russian 76th Guards Air Assault Division is an admission that the Ukrainian progress has reached such a critical state for the Russian invasion army that they are even forced to deploy one of their offensive forces for defensive operations. It does not only prove the level of desperation, but also diminishes Russian capabilities for offensive operations. Furthermore, the Russian offensive at Kupiansk Kremina is now completely exposed for what it is, a diversionary tactic. Okay, let's just try and uh, have a look and see what that all means. So as we look at all the different... Um, uh, lines here and if we look at my map we'll take a uh, a second to say okay uh, there's been a lot of talk about this sector the northeast sector from Kupiansk to Svatova to Kremina being diversionary it appears that the Russians really wanted to attack towards a place called Barova from um from this kind of western of west of Svatova position this Raya Rodka uh, and downwards to Novovodyanye including the little village that's been the center of attention there, Novoherovka. So they've wanted to get to Barova, which is on the Oskil River or near the Oskil River, so that they can get a greater uh, sort of buffer zone to their Luhansk Oblast front line here. But they got as far as five kilometers and then were forced back. And even though they might have had like minor gains there again recently near Novoherovka, maybe just the odd field or so here and there, they are not getting anywhere further there and they've also had to as Tendar said move their assault uh, elite assault uh, unit the VDV division called the 76th guard uh, assault division which is one of their best units and move it from Kremina also they were active in Bakhmut elements of it and move them down to this Robotina um, or Robotna uh, sector now that we've talked a lot about this that to me shows that they are throwing everything in the kitchen sink at this these are offensive troops being used for defensive duties and they are basically manning trenches uh, although there are there is some counter-attacking that's taking place in the area as you can see by different colored dots going on there we'll talk about that a little bit later but the idea is that that they i think are throwing everything they've got into defending here to stop the floodgates opening and the ukrainians taking advantage of you know potential breakthroughs there which i think shows that they don't have a lot of strength in depth they don't really have an awful lot of reserves to draw on if really at all any i mean there is some talk kenneth greg mentions in fact we'll go to look at that now before we return to uh, Tendar. So Kenneth Gregg, the Finnish fighter in uh, Ukraine, says the Russians have attempted counterattacks north of Verbove in an attempt to stop our flank attacks on Verbove itself. They have developed their so-called, they have deployed their so-called elite and have temporarily stopped us. We will again see in a few days, uh, a few days of exploitation tactics from our people before we break through their line of attack. As I said before, Verbove is vital to the Russians. They have also brought troops from the Staromyorsky front to Verbove, which opened up for our troops on this section of the front. Our troops took the offered chance and advanced in the direction of Novodonetsk. Okay, so what's going on here? And put that in the context of what Tendar is saying. So this is a Velikonova Silka area where the Ukrainians have had some joy in a place, actually not Novodonetsk, Novomyorsk here, where they've pushed in and pushed the Russians back to the southern uh, area of that settlement. The Russians, uh, uh, apparently, according to at least Kenneth Gregg, I haven't heard this previously, but had moved, moved their troops from this area to help support uh, Robotina to the west. Now, that left 
the theory is that left them short in this direction so the ukrainians took advantage of that in other words they really don't have the strength in depth if they're drawing from other frontline troops to bring them from one area of the front line to another area of the front line and this kind of idea that they they have a blanket that is not quite big enough to cover the whole front line and when they pull it to one side of the bed it kind of leaves an, another area open but it keeps this area warm but that area is has got no cover so then you put it back in in that direction at least somewhere else open over there so they only have so much so many resources and that's not enough to adequately cover the whole front line so they are pulling from one area to cover another and leaving that area unprotected and this i think is is a serious problem for the russians so going back to what uh, tender said in reference to my post a few days ago Oh, and to say that also that that activity in the northeast se sector was a diversionary uh, tactic, and it's a diversionary tactic that hasn't really worked. So the Ukrainians haven't drawn on their, um, as I've said before, their counteroffensive resources to do the defending here, and it looks like the Ukraine the Russians don't remotely have enough to get to Barova. In the same way that you might say, well, the Ukrainians don't have enough to get to Berdyansk or Mariupol. And I'd agree with that. I think, you know, that's a long term goal and it's not going to happen in this stage of the counteroffensive. Uh, but it, I don't think the Russians remotely have the uh, opportunity to get as far as Barova in this northeastern sector. And if they do, it will be because they pull themselves short in other places on the front line, which will open themselves up. So I just don't think I think it's a diversion at best. Uh, and even that, I don't think it's particularly succeeded at. So Tendot says, in reference to my post a few days ago, where I, again, and repeatedly before, paraphrase the importance of logistics, I can only re-emphasize that the real battle in the South is about logistics and supply lines. Uh, I'd say it's it's about that and attrition of artillery and air defences. I think that's really what's going on. This goes back to what I've been saying the last couple of days, where I'm, and this Tendar piece really gives me a sense that actually things are... Are happening for the ukrainians that are, are really good but we don't necessarily see it mentioned in the mainstream media so it might not translate into territorial gains and sorry to repeat myself again but you've got different levels of objective the ultimate level of objective for the ukrainians is to take territory but it's not their most pressing objective right now it's about hammering logistics as mentioned it's about uh, attriting russian air defense it's about attriting predominantly russian artillery and equipment and troops as well once you take those as more pressing objectives you understand that they feed into the overarching objective of taking territory so right now you're not seeing territory being taken because these other objectives are actually they actually have primacy so the ukrainians are concentrating on these other objectives and it, 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 it might not look like they're they're making any territorial gains, so you might think it's a stalemate, but it's not a stalemate. They are very busy doing things that are that are hammering the Russian ability to do defense and offense going forward, right? So th th this is this is a really significant period where the Ukrainians are eking out an asymmetrical. Uh, scenario where the, the Russians just don't have the artillery and air defense and logistics to be able to to do anything effective uh, going forward. So really, the mainstream media should be talking about the figures of Russian losses. And I was saying this morning that you could have military historians if this is what Tendar and myself think to be the case. If this is the best case, I think scenario of, of the data that we're that we're hearing about. If that's if that's true what the general staff are telling us then you could have military historians look back at this and said that this was a really incredibly effective way of the ukrainians doing war with limited resources so the ukrainians don't have air support right they can't do the things that nato would expect which is a month of air uh, attacks and then move your combined arms you know forces in uh, to do the stuff on the ground with close air support you don't have that. So they're having to sit back and do all the close air support stuff or not close air support, but do the suppression of enemy air defences, destruction of enemy air defences and artillery with their own ranged artillery. Right. And and high Mars, Caesars, Panzer Hits of 2000s, etc, etc, all that kind of stuff. They're doing this over a much more prolonged period and lots of people are getting jittery thinking, well, they're not making any territorial gains. No, and, and if I was the Ukrainians, I'd be like, yeah, I'm not bothered. I'm not dancing to your tune here. This is this is our plan. And we, we adjusted our plans because those original NATO plans didn't work. Right. Because we didn't have air support. 
So we didn't have air superiority. So we're doing it our way. And our way is a kind of hybrid version where we're doing everything the Air, air Force should do, but we're doing it with artillery. And it takes longer to do that. And however long it takes, it will take. But we are going to wait until we have attrited the enemy equipment to such a point, and that includes logistics, logistics routes, and logistics supplies, you know, supply depots and whatnot, to such a point that the the Russians are unable to defend adequately and indeed unable to go on the offensive at a later date. So Ukrainians not only hammer the front line, but the whole logistical network of the Russian army. The more Russian troops move in, harder it gets for them to sustain that level of logistical support, a proficiency where they already prove to be weak. Additionally, Russians are taking more and more risks by not only bringing more of their troops into Russian, you sorry, Ukrainian artillery range, but also exposing other frontline sectors, exactly what I was talking about earlier. Uh, the attrition rate of the Russian army units comes on top of that too. So we've got attrition of logistics, we've got attrition of, of artillery and air defense, but also just their troops in general. We already have an eyewitness accounts of Russian POWs. And in fact, there's a claim. I was going to leave it for tomorrow, but there's a claim. I'll see if I can find it now that, that might feed into this. Let's see if it's this one. Um, yes. So after the special operation Cynthia, which is where they got that Mi-8 helicopter from, from the Russians um, and got it to surrender, the number of Russian military personnel willing to surrender has increased by 70%. said you saw a representative of the GUR. Now, that might be over eight. So let's say 50%, 30%, whatever. Uh, but the idea is that Russian POWs are, not, are now starting to uh, turn up at a greater rate. And we've already heard that, that a huge amount of them have, have surrendered using the hotline from you know September last year to now. It was 16,000 according to Ukrainians. So I take up the pinch of salt from September to May. And obviously we've had some months since May. So that's, that's a lot of people uh, surrendering to, to the Ukrainians. So if that's true, then you know that's another element. Uh, and as Tendar says, disclosing profound Russian losses even within their newly deployed formations, such as the above mentioned 76th Division. Um, so Tatulkami's talked about this. The strategy of the Ukrainian army might not look spectacular, but it works when continued to its logical end. It is exactly how an army would operate in order to soften up an entrenched enemy to a point where it is untenable to continue to fight and they would have to withdraw. All that is needed is stamina and patience. And let's go and just quickly look at what Tatarigami says. Uh, so lots of analysis of scorch marks and the uh, evidence of the Ukrainians absolutely hammering Novoprokhorovka by with artillery there. Uh, so there's satellite imagery analysis there. But I think this stuff like this is probably what Tendar's referring to. A few insights from POWs of the 76th Division. So the 76th are already suffering in terms of losing to, uh, losing personnel to being prisoners of war. Two regiments suffered losses, necessitating the withdrawal of entire companies for refitting. They criticised incompetent leadership, leading to continuous casualties from artillery and drones. They called it a real hell. Now, we had heard, I don't know whether he's referring to Chris O'Wicky's 76th Division claims from, actually, from um, Bakhmut when they were there before they came down to uh, the Robotina area. But... You know, the, the, there are huge problems that are brought about. There's huge problems with the Russian army brought about by consistently hammering logistics, by consistently hammering, uh, you know, artillery so that they the Russians can't do active and effective counter battery fire that leads to low morale, which then leads to uh, becoming, you know, surrendering uh, more easily. And so... When I'm at my most positive, I'm up and down with the whole counteroffensive. How do I feel? But actually, what if I'm being perfectly honest right now, I, I think this is about patience. And it's about putting, getting all your ducks in a row, get, getting all of the jigsaw pieces lined up. You know, you've got the outside of the jigsaw. You're painstakingly putting that in place, putting all these big areas of your jigsaw puddle, puzzle, getting them together. Then you finally put your piece in place so it all comes together and the picture is... Um, is presented beautifully for you now it could be it could be that the ukrainians are doing that and they're getting everything in order so then you you put your final jigsaw pieces in place which is and now we're ready to do the kind of large maneuvers we we, we are seeing that there are small scale maneuvers happening so even when you're looking at places on the front line and sorry i know i haven't got to front line yet properly but when you look at places like nova Mayorska and you see the successes they've had there 
these successes might seem, oh, that's quite good. They, they've taken half the town. They're doing that with like 12 people being dropped off in MRAPs, right? Or APCs, dropping them off here. Then the vehicles skedaddle and they're just moving forward with just a really small, like this is not a big attack. You know, you haven't got like 50 tanks attacking with like, you know, 500 troops and or whatever. This isn't some like huge attack here. This is like really small scale probing attack. So when the Ukrainians are having successes in many of these places, I'm not saying all of them, Robotina you could argue is, is, is a larger scale affair, but there are places along this front where they're doing their, their activity with relatively small numbers of people, which shows that they're still kind of doing probing. They're still trying to find these weaknesses because the main consideration is your ranged ordnance and hitting logistics and equipment still. You know, they want to get to a position where the Russian artillery is absolutely uh, degraded to a point where it is it is not able to do what, what they want it to do. Anyway, that's enough preamble. That's a huge preamble. Let's go essentially to Bakhmut first. So there's not a lot. There's, yes, there's, you know, repelled attacks on up and down here. RSW will give you more granular detail about things happening uh, along that front but um, we're going to come down we're actually not quite to Bakhmut first we're going to go to Spurna which is north of Bakhmut on the Seversk front line here and actually the Ukrainians have taken quite a bit of land as according to uh, Suret Maps however Suret Maps then is moving the line in line with the Russian defensive line in line with Andrew Perpetua what he already had so you know whether this is kind of like one of those oh, okay it's been like this for ages but it turns out it's not like that and we're going to change it now and say the Ukrainians have actually attacked or whether this has been the case for a long time I can't say nonetheless um Suryat Maps Pro Russian Mapper says a situation on the Eastern Front, the recent Russian bombardment over Spirna allowed to correct the front line in the Axis, which confirms the Russian army is no longer present in the village. Uh, and that is your admission of the latter. This isn't necessarily a big success for the Ukrainians, but it does get a bit more accuracy. So gains is probably the wrong word. That's, that's a rejig. Uh, so sorry, my, my bad there. I, I did that in a hurry. Uh, it is a, a rejig for um, Surat maps to go in line with Andrew Perpetua's lines and uh, I, I, my opinion you know is that Andrew Perpetua is largely going to be more accurate than Surat maps in most cases it depends there's sometimes where Surat maps can give you um, something that's much more topical something's just happened with where there's an attack where Andrew Perpetua might wait for shelling analysis on the next round of um, uh, satellite imagery but as expected so we're going to go down now to uh, Bakhmut, sorry, so a little bit further down, and it, it's not about the north. There are there is activity to the north. Uh, Russians, I think, might be pushing, trying to push in the Yurokova Vasilivka area uh, and around here. But really, it's about uh, what's going on to the south. Uh, although there are no pins on my map, it, it seems that uh, a lot a lot of the talk is about Andrivka. The Ukrainians appear to be in Andrivka. I said it was liberated yesterday, or a grey zone is one of the two, and. Um, Broadly going to be the same today. So War Gonzo, pro-Russian pro source says, as expected, War Gonzo reports that the Ukrainians have entered Andrivka. Yeah, if you invested in cutting, has invested in cutting off the supply route to the small village, which now seems to be paying off. And that's a tactic we see in a num number of places. We saw that in Kishchivka, hit the grand lines of communication coming into any given place, uh, like they did with that one coming in from the north. And then suddenly the Russians are unable to supply their troops and they have to pull out. It seems that that was the same with Andrivka as well well uh peace style one one says ukrainian forces entered andrivka south of bakhmut logical step after clearing almost completely uh Klishivka. and some other sources uh, were saying yesterday that actually andrivka is a uh, fully in control uh, ukrainians are fully in control of that it's been liberated it's going to be somewhere between the, those two points really uh and then coming down from there there's not much to say about kurdyumivka uh or anywhere else along that part of the front line Although there's no doubt lots of activity taking place, we're going to come down to Avdivka here, where Andrew Perpetua said, and he did announce this as a rejig, rather like Syriac Maps just up there. So there's a rejig to the north in Vaseli area, just showing you in case you check out Andrew Perpetua's map and there are these big changes. You're thinking, oh, it was not that big. It's just that field there and a little bit here by this, uh, by Vaseli and Kamyanka and this kind of water feature there. Nonetheless, uh, that has that has changed for him now more importantly down here at Opitny it appears that 
I would go as far as to say that I'm confident that Opit Opitny is under control of the Ukrainians now, which is an absolutely massive uh, achievement because they've been fighting over this since really the beginning of the war. If you see where the uh, the previous annexation lines were coming just north of the airport, there's famous fights over the airport with the 93rd. Uh, the Ukrainians concede, you know, they ceded Opitny eventually and Vodjanie. Really tough fights for these. Um, for them to get that back, which I think they have done, I'm going to go out on a limb and say I think they probably have liberated Opitny. There are claims coming in. That is a case. Uh, we have the Hannah Maliar saying that, that they they have taken the northern half of it. So that's the Deputy Defence Minister saying that yesterday. Uh, I would think that that probably indicates that they're that having good luck in that area. Um, Ukrainian troops liberated part of the village of Opitny near Avdivka. And then here we have during chaotic retreating from Opitny, so dead district saying, implying that the Russians have retreated from there, that Russian artillery conducted a fire of red on red or blue on blue, friendly fire, killing 27 of their own troops and wounding 34 more. That is the claim from there. So the, whether that's due to communications issues with electronic warfare or just really bad uh, aiming, or indeed we've heard that they've done this for their own retreating troops to stop their own troops retreating, doing that with artillery, purposefully calling on artillery on their own troops. So instead of using barrier troops, you're using barrier artillery. Um, all of those are plausible explanations. Uh, no panic. Everything's going according to plan, uh, says this source. Translation of a Russian source is nationalists of the armed forces of Ukraine were able to capture the settlement of Opitny, which is not far from Donetsk airport. Now fighting is taking place on the outskirts of the airport. The situation is difficult, said Ian Gagin, advisor to the acting uh, leader of the Donetsk People's Republic. So if these are indeed the, the true claims of the, or the yeah, really what these guys are claiming, then it looks like fighting is could well be taking place on the outskirts of the airport in this kind of area between Opitny and the airport. It makes you wonder what's then going to happen with Vodjanie. Uh, does this make the Russian positions there untenable? Would they want to pull out there as the Ukrainians are having some success coming up through Pisky as well from Pervomysky? So Andrew Perpetual, although there's no changes to the Def Russian defensive lines, he does go have an improvement of Ukrainian consolidated ground in that area, taking it from the grey zone. So the Ukrainians are progressing from here and from Opitny in the north there. So th this this could be an attempt to do a pincer movement. It's quite a big and bold effort. Uh, apparently the attack on Opitny was a kind of a lightning attack that the Russians weren't expecting due to the fact that they were distracted with doing stuff themselves up in the northern area up here and while they were doing that the Ukrainians uh, took the opportunity to hit them here whether this is also because troops from the area have been drafted down to the southern front line or something I don't know I'm just complete speculation but it, it could be what's going on but nonetheless I think this is a super important um, outcome uh, in the area and uh, Max23 today said, not official yet, but Opitny, welcome home. So I think, you know, there is an awful lot of uh, rumour going around that Opitny has been fully uh, liberated. And as I say, that is that is significant uh, news, I think. Uh, we're going to go down. Yeah, we'll come down to that next. So we're now going to pop out from there. I haven't heard anything from Marienka. There are some pretty bad news to the Ukrainians there recently, as the Russians seem to have advanced fairly well. But... No, heard nothing since. Heard nothing particularly about Pavlivka either or uh, Shevchenko area south of Vukhladar. We're moving on to Novomayorsk and Novodonetsk. Not too much information. As you can see, no pins showing any territorial changes in this whole sector. So there's a Vlika Novosilka sector where, again, bear in mind what I said earlier, the, the, the success that the Ukrainians have had in this area have been successes with relatively few troops they are not committing huge resources again it's almost like these are probing shaping operations or just probing reconnaissance and force operations to find out where weaknesses are and they find a bit of a weakness and they they try and exploit it but they don't exploit it with large amounts of equipment i think budanov has just come out and said we are not using i wonder if i can find that again i don't know if i have that to hand um but it's another quote saying we are basically not using huge amounts of um of our uh that's the wrong one i am going to find it for you not we're not using huge amounts of equipment to do what we're doing 
Yeah, so here it is. So Budinov in, in, in charge of intelligence. For the most part, unfortunately, our counteroffensive is on our feet. So according to him, ATGMs and kamikaze drones have greatly reduced the effectiveness effectiveness of any armored vehicles so they're doing most things by dropping off small numbers of troops uh they've got obviously the issue of minefields but they've got you know loitering munitions and atgms to contend with as well so they're not committing huge forces to any given area uh, and again that just m makes you wonder whether they will be able you know you assume therefore when the time is right, they'll be able to do that. They have a lot in reserve. We haven't seen Challenger 2s, really. We haven't seen a great deal of Leopard 2s. We've got infantry fighting vehicles still being delivered. We've got Abrams to be brought to bear. We've got Leopard 1 tanks that are coming online now. So you're thinking at some point there could be some sizable forces that could throw at these positions. They're just waiting for exactly the right moment. And the time is obviously not right yet. So again, it goes back to what Tendar was saying uh, and what, what I've been saying as well. Um, so anyway, we're moving on down to the, uh, well, we go to what's being said about uh, Donetsk. I haven't uh, dipped into the sources here. Ukrainian forces advance around Priyutne, uh, Zaporizhia Oblast, confirmed by Deep State. The Ukrainians are creating multiple pressure points for the Russian troops in the Zaporizhia direction. Now, I haven't got the map change on DR. Oh, no, sorry. I don't use Deep State around this area because... Uh, it's just too many lines. I've used them in the Robotna area and Bakhmut and Avdivka. So this is to say that the Ukrainians might have counterattacked back where the uh, where in Priyutne area the Russians had had some success previously, and that's good news for the Ukrainians there. So watch out for a change with these two mappers possibly uh, over the next day or so. Uh, Rebar says of this whole sector that two Ukrainian brigades have withdrawn. So this is a pro-Russian source, very propagandistic, but, you know, what are the Russians saying? Preparing for a new attack on Novomayorsky. Uh, the enemy continues, so the Ukrainians continue attacking Novodonetsk to Novomayorsky with three attacks last night. Ukrainian tactics haven't changed. Armoured vehicles bring infantry to forest belts. Assault groups try to enter Russian positions. All attacks failed. Obviously, they're going to say that. Russian fire forcing the Ukrainians to retreat. Uh, Russian forces struck frontline targets, suppressing mortar activity. Um, uh, Russian troops destroyed an electronic war station south of Rivnipil. And an MLRS strike destroyed an Ukrainian stronghold near Priyutne with 13 members of Ukrainian formations inside. Okay, so some of that may or may not be true. Uh, reports, or all of it may or may not be true, reports also appeared uh, about the withdrawal of units 23 and 31 brigades from the front. After summer battles and significant losses, they want to restore combat capability in Mishiva and Hirovka in the Dnipropetrov region. The enemy won't back down from another offensive in the Vremivka sector. We are only talking about changing the direction of the attack from Staromanivka to Novomayorska to, the, to that end. In Prechistivka, Ukrainian formations remand assault groups of the 35th Brigade. Okay, what does all that mean? So I think that still goes to say that they're not really attacking on force. In force, they are doing exactly what they're saying. This is Rebar saying, yep, they're dropping off small infantry groups. And even when we hit strongholds, you know, that's 13 troops. These aren't massive amounts of troops being used at any one position around here and that the Ukrainians may still be refitting and you know rotating and, and, and doing all that around here but they are getting ready maybe to strike in slightly different places than, than might have been expected towards Staromilnivka or it could be that might be you know Zavitnia, Bajania and Staromilnivka might be major objectives but they're just refitting and waiting and might, while they're doing that there's there's an opportunity has um has arisen somewhere else um anyway going on to robotina now as you can see there are some there's good and bad news i guess for the ukrainians depending on where you look in this salient so pretty much what we said yesterday here war mapper is more positive for the ukrainians saying that they're hey they're attacking everywhere ukrainians continue to gradually advance between nova prokopivka which is here, and Verbove, which is there. Uh, they've also taken new positions north of Novoprokopivka and uh, to the east as well. So this is the added positions for the Ukrainians, but doesn't really talk about having lost any positions to the north of Verbove, as others do. So Syriac Maps here saying that while the Ukrainian army continually advances south and eastwards, um, in Robotina, of Robotina, the Russian army has launched a counterattack and managed to recapture a series of positions north of Above. So I have that here. That's what both Andrew Perpetua, sorry, that's what both Deep State 
maps. I didn't have a kind of yellow equivalent. So it's the same color as Andrew Perpetua's ones. And Spirit maps are stating. So they agree. Both of those mappers agree. Andrew Perpetua doesn't at the moment, but that could be that he just doesn't have the shelling data yet. Uh, and it may end up being the case that he does agree. They also say, um, Syriac Maps, that Ukrainians have had success just north of Novopokopivka. Uh, they're advancing towards the town, taking control over several positions, including the ones east of Robotina, which have come under complete control of the Ukrainians. So that is to say they are having success in one place and finding it challenging in another. Here's another source, Sarin, saying counterattack, uh, Russian counter assaults at the eastern part of Robotina pocket uh, gives them the Russians some gains there and some small gains to the Ukrainians, exactly where we we're just talking about. So that's kind of confirming those. And here's another uh, source saying that those tank battles that I was talking about yesterday have signified that the Russian defensive line really is further back than uh, than some mappers are giving credit for. Uh, geolocated footage shows presence of Ukrainian tanks east of Novopokopivka. Tanks operating at such a close distance suggest that the Ukrainians have cleared most, if not all, of the Russian positions east and northeast, and oh, that's of Novopokopivka, and Russian forces now only have solid control over the positions on the outskirts of the town. Yesterday, Russian drones showed presence of Ukrainian infantry on the eastern part of the main trench line north of Novopokopivka, uh, confirming the news about Ukrainian advance in this direction so the we do have I mean I think this is more of a pro-Russian map there we've got sense that the Ukrainians are actually uh here um on on the uh the Russian defensive lines there but you, you get the idea that the Russians are being pushed right back around Novopokopivka but could be having some joy north of Vobove and Global War Monitor talks about those tank battles here uh and that geolocation has caused an expansion of the liberated uh, land in the area. So that is what we have there. Andrew Perpetua talks about those two changes. That's actually elsewhere. That's in the wrong area, but just being rejigs and not that's in north of Abdivka. And also actually Novoprokopivka there. Um, so he says that that's really the only two changes. So that's why it is in that section. Actually, I'm not so stupid. So this is uh, moving over to here that, that there are some Russian gains, just small gains there, or it could be a, a rejig. Uh, not wholly sure. I think it is a rejig because not in that tweet, but another one, he talks about it. Yeah, just clarification. Changes on my map, they, none of them represent advances. So that's the one in Vaseli and here. So that isn't a gain, that is a rejig. Sorry, I should have written that as rejig. This is what happens when I do the map and not JR. <laughs> I make cock up after cock up. Uh, so that's a rejig. So anyway, the point is that the Ukrainians are gaining down in this area around Novoprokopivka, and the Russians are gaining uh, up north of Vobove, it seems. Um, and that could be a bit of a challenge because that's closing the gap, the, the neck of this um, cauldron. Uh, I don't think it's that that worrying. I think the Ukrainians will be well onto that. But uh, but yeah, you, you certainly want to 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 put an end to any further Russian advances because it makes it much more difficult to supply your troops in that cauldron. Right, so that's uh, that area done. We're going to come out of here and move to the west to look at some gains somewhere that we haven't seen gains for a long time. So this is north of Zherebyanki and this is uh, Syriac Maps. We're going to go back to uh, here and look at those gains which are where are you here you are right so Suryat maps says that on the Zaporizhia front during the last few days Ukrainian army has managed to make small gains north of Zerebyanki trying to overpass the town and head to the nearby Luhove so I was asked uh, I was oh, I was asking yesterday where those gains were were they gains because there was talk about gains towards Luhove from the north from Kamyanska or was it from the northeast from you know just north of Zerebyanki and actually it was where I least expected it which is from the northeast here so they the Ukrainians are pushing towards Luhove from this direction and that would help to uh, kind of flank Zerebyanki and encircle it so eventually it's only um, suppliable from the south rather than along this main road there and if they can do that it's rather like they are doing with a number of these places like Klitschivka and Drivka so on and so forth 
you you insert you operationally encircle them and then force the, the Russians to pull out because it's untenable to hold. Uh, so anyway, that's that's good news for the Ukrainians there because that's been a bit of a, an area of stasis for a long time now. Okay, not too much going on on the Kherson River front, the Dnipro River. There is quite a bit to be said about these gas uh, rigs out in the Black Sea. So we're going to go there next. Um, next to here says Ukraine has regained control of the Boyko towers in the Black Sea. There are two drilling rigs for gas production. They were captured by the Russians in 2015 and have since been used for military purposes. Obviously, very useful for placing, you know, radars there, air defense systems. That gives you really good uh, coverage um, of marine activities, but also onto the mainland as well so that, that's going to be useful for either side there's a really extended good extended video from no reports you can see it variously online uh, on how the special operations forces of the rush of the ukrainians managed to take control of those platforms uh and near the coast of crimea in the black sea so uh, 13 and a half minutes i'm not going to show you that now but you can go and check that out uh worth having a look at there is activity going on there now whether that will change hands whether the russians will try and take them back i don't know there were claims over the last few days that the russians had the russians claimed themselves that they had destroyed uh three ukrainian boats out of six or seven that were attacking the tarkankut cape here and they claim with su 34 ms that they sunk the um the those boat or three of those boats whether that's true or not i don't know it's plausible it's possible as well obviously possible and plausible um, whether it happened, who knows? It'll come out in the wash. Right, that's what's happened on the front line. Thank you. Sorry for my um, elongated analysis at the beginning. Please like, subscribe, and share. Really appreciate all of your support. Um, take care, and I'll speak soon.